Well, hello and welcome back. Uh, we are looking at Galatians again. Uh, we're bringing it to the end. We've got this lesson and next lesson, and then we'll be done. And uh, at the end of next lesson, we'll talk about what follows. Uh, it'll be a very, very good study for the winter. Uh, if you have your Bibles, open them up to Galatians chapter 6. We're looking at that last chapter, verses 1 to 10. You know, one, one of the things Paul will do in his letters, and believing this is his first letter, it might be that he starts a pattern here. But uh, he will start to give what may be considered a kind of loose connection or loosely connected list of exhortations. Uh, there's somewhat of that here. There's also some, as you read, that uh, kind of match up with what he was just talking about in the previous chapter on the fruit of the Spirit and things like that. Uh, he'll bring in again the issue of the law, uh, bring up again the need to help one another, and how we can carry out the law by doing that. So we're going to be looking at that as we move forward today. Uh, lesson. 12 is entitled Carry On, and uh, it's kind of an idea of keep going. That's going to come up in the end of this section, but in the beginning of the section, there are two places where the idea of carrying comes up, and it has to do with carrying burdens or carrying loads. We'll talk about that, so the title is kind of uniquely suitable or suited to our lesson because of the double, the double meaning of the word carry. If you have your Bibles, open them up to chapter 6, verses 1 through 10. I'll read the text now, then I'll open up uh, the, the, the PowerPoint to show you the, uh, the outline of the text. It's going to be a very, very practical outline, uh, nothing fancy. Uh, many points more, usually more, we're going to have more points than we normally do, because uh, what Paul is doing is kind of piecing together a number of things that he wants to give as injunctions and final exhortations to the Galatians before he moves on. So let me go ahead and read this to you. Again, I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible, the 2020 edition. And it reads this way. Brothers and sisters, even if a person is caught in any wrongdoing, you who are spiritual are to restore such a person um, in a spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself so that you are not tempted as well. Bear one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks that he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But each one must examine his own work, and then he will have reason for boasting, but to himself alone and not to another. For each one will bear his own load. The one who is taught the word is to share all good things with the one who teaches him. Do not be deceived, God is not mocked, for whatever a person sows, this he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will reap destruction from the flesh, but the one who sows to the Spirit will reap eternal life from the Spirit. Let's not become discouraged in doing good, but in due time we will reap if we do not become weary. So then, while we have opportunity, let's do good to all people, and especially to those or of the household of the faith. Well, let me take a quick look at the outline as we go forward so that we can see how we're going to break up the text. As I said, there's much that connects this from uh, to the previous lesson or the previous chapter that we discussed in the previous lesson, but there's also much that uh, kind of brings up the themes from the entire letter. First, uh, coming to one another's aid, and I've done that because there's not only the need to come to one's aid when they're sinful, but also when they just need help. Chapter 6, verses 1 to 2. Then there's the need for self-examination. We see that in chapter 6, verses 3 to 5. Uh, share with your teacher, um, chapter 6, verse 6. Uh, warning, the idea of reaping and sowing, verses 7 through 8, and really carrying on the idea of reaping, but in a good way. Paul talks in chapter 6, verses 9 to 10 about doing good. So let's take a look at this text a little bit more closely. We can see, first of all, coming to one another's aid. Paul says, brothers and sisters, and of course, the New American Standard is going to add the word sisters there. The word brothers is a word in general that recognizes all the believers, not just the men in the congregation. So that needs to be stated. Uh, I know that even the old, uh, older English word brethren, um, while it sounds like brothers, is not tied just to the male gender, but is referenced to all people in the congregation. And Paul uh, is saying brothers here, but yeah, I think it's helpful in our modern generation to make sure that everyone knows that that's an inclusive term. And as a result, the New American Standard updates that to say brothers and sisters, and I think rightly so. Uh, 
He says, even if a person is caught in an uh, in an, in a in any wrongdoing, you who are spiritual ought to restore such a person in a spirit of gentleness, each one looking to his to yourself, so that you are not tempted as well. A couple of things going on here. First, there is the need to help someone uh, while they're in a sinful situation. Uh, Paul says that we are to reach out to them. Um, now there are ways to do that. We have to be mindful to do it without judging. We need to do it without ridiculing. The goal here is to bring them back to restoration, bring them back to redemption. And the idea there is that their wrongdoing is moving them away from God. What Paul is saying here is do the what is necessary to bring them back to God. Incidentally, that's exactly what Paul is doing with this letter. He sees the Galatians going the wrong way, seeking to follow the law as a means to live out the Christian life or even to find salvation. And he says that's not the right thing to do. So he spent the entire letter doing exactly what this verse says, and that is he is calling out the wrongdoing. And that's going to be important. Part of helping to disciple one another, part of helping to um, encourage one another and to build each other up is to identify when something's wrong. And Paul says that needs to be done. Now, he also gives some word of instruction here and almost a word of warning when he says this. If anyone's caught up in the wrongdoing, you who are spiritual need to restore him. Doing it gently, and I know that Paul at times in this letter was really, really harsh, but he still calls them brothers. He still calls them beloved. He still thinks of them as family, but he does need, he does see the need to correct them. But he says at the end of that verse, uh, make sure when you do so uh, to watch out yourself so you don't fall into temptation so that uh, you're not also going to be tempted to what's going on there. So uh, we said this in the previous lesson. Um, sometimes when we see someone else doing something that's not our own, our own particular sin, it's easy to judge them. But Paul is saying you need to be careful. Uh, here, you need to be careful as you're helping someone out. Uh, don't be tempted to do wrong yourself. And that could be do wrong in the same way or do wrong in another way by being judgmental. He talks about boasting here in a second as well. It's important to recognize uh, the attitude that we're supposed to have. This is supposed to be an attitude of helping one another, coming to one another's aid so that we can bring them back into a right relationship with Christ. This is all about restoration. It's all about unity. It's all about bringing people uh, into the fold and back into the fold, like chasing after the sheep that are lost. Uh, clearly, in that metaphor, the point is lost in salvation here someone who may be turning away from the faith or, or turning away from following the faith in the way that it has originally been um, indicated to us and it's been passed down to us. Paul says that we need to be helpful to one another. Someone's caught in a wrongdoing. We need to help them, but just watch yourself. And he'll carry on that idea of self-examination in verses three to five, as we'll see. But here, the key is, issue is as you help, be careful you don't fall into the same, temp the same temptation. He says in verse 2, bear one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. Now, uh, this idea of bearing one another's burdens is the idea of carrying it. Again, the idea uh, with the word carry there, um, it's the idea of bearing or carrying about. And the, uh, the idea of burdens there is the idea of a weight or a heavy weight and a heavy burden. Um, he says when you do this, and I'll come back to this word in a moment, we look at the next uh, couple of verses. But he says, in doing this, we fulfill the law of Christ. And notice here he's qualified it as the law of Christ, whereas before he talks about the law. So what does he mean by the law of Christ versus the law? Well, this is the law that Christ would have given to us in the, in the sense that this is what Jesus instructs us to do. We are to help one another. We are to guide one another. We are to love one another. Um, one author wrote a book uh, several years ago. I think it's Scott McKnight wrote a book called The Jesus Creed. And there it's about loving God and loving your neighbor. And one of the things that Paul is doing here is as he's echoed Jesus' own words as the greatest commandment is to love God and to love your neighbor, he also goes on to talk about how that fulfills the law. Well, Jesus has given his own law. And Paul is saying, as we bear one another's burdens, as we help each other with what we're going through, uh, we fulfill the law of Christ. We are loving one another. And as a result, fulfilling the law of Christ, Jesus gave us the command to love one another. Keep in mind, then, he says, bear one another's burdens, because many of your translations are going to see that same terminology later in this next section and say that there's a problem there. How can you bear your own burdens? Or how should someone bear their own burdens while also bearing others' burdens? Let's talk about that. Let's do that right now. Verses 3 to 5. Verses 3 to 5 read this way. 
For if anyone thinks that he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself, but each one must examine his own work, and then he will have reason for boasting, but to himself alone and not to another, for each will bear his own load. Well, one of the things I want to say is that while there are a number of injunctions going on here that we can separate them out, clearly there's a connection from one to the next. Here, the connection is the idea of self-examination. He says, watch out for yourself, verses, uh, verse 1. Um, and then bearing one another's loads. Uh, he talks about being careful with the way we help other people so as not to fall into temptation. So there's that idea of watchfulness. In verses three through five, he then again brings up this idea of examination. And in this case, against boasting, the temptation to boast, as we talked a moment ago, about boasting about your own life when someone else is in sin. Never mind, there might be a sin that you're carrying that you need to get rid of as well. Someone needs to come to your rescue or someone's need to come to your rescue. So he's, he's tying all of this together and moving forward with it. So if you think you're something when you're nothing, then you're deceiving yourself. And that idea of deception is going to come up again in the ensuing verses. So there's a lot of linking that's going on here. Individual injunctions, but brought together by certain linking words that shows how Paul is tying all of this together. And it all comes down then to, again, walking in the Spirit, as we talked about in the previous lesson. Examine yourself, he says. Everyone should examine himself. Then there will be reason for boasting. Now, he says not to anyone else, but to yourself. Now, the idea there of boasting is having a certain self-pride and so forth. But the, the key here is that it's in a right way. It's in a way that suggests that I'm not comparing myself to someone else, and therefore now I can boast. It's more along the lines of what am I doing in my right relationship with God? What am I doing in the right relationship that I have with Jesus and being led by the Spirit? That kind of boasting then is not going to be boasting about oneself to oneself. It can be an internal pride, if you will, but certainly it's not one which we compare ourselves to others and talk about how much better we are than one another. Uh, he follows that up with then in verse 5. Each one will bear his own load. So what's going on here? If we're to bear one another's burdens and then also bear our own load, what's going on? Well, the NASB is rightly putting together for us the fact that there are two different words used for load or weight or burden here. In verse chapter 1 or chapter 2, it says, bear one another's burdens plural, that may be key, um, bearing more than your own load, you need help. Um, the word for carry or bear is the same word in both injunctions, and so that's not the issue. The issue has to do with the fact that there, each one of us has our own responsibility. The word there has to do with ticket. It's, it's almost a word that um, is, a, is a bill of lading, and it's what you're supposed to carry with you. And uh, as we look at the word, the idea there is an invoice as a part of freight that therefore can be described in some way as what is your task, what is your service. There are many burdens, many weights, many loads that we might carry that are too much for us, and therefore we need to bear one another's burdens, carry, help carry one another's burden. But Paul is saying here that we need to tend to ourselves. We have our own burden. We have our own load. In other words, we have our own ticket. We have what is assigned to us that may be the need for self-examination so as to rightly understand who we are in Christ so that we can have right reflection upon who we are in Christ. And ultimately, when we have a right relationship with Christ and have a right view of ourselves, there's not going to be any boasting anyway. There, there may be a sense of internal pride, and there's nothing wrong with that, but certainly it's not a pride that's done in comparison with one another. We each have our own, our own load to carry, our own bill of lading, if you will, our own ticket of freight, something that's been assigned to us. Me, individually, it's my responsibility. And Paul picks up on that when he says to examine yourself. As you are helping someone else, be mindful of who you are. You are helping others with loads that are too burdensome for them to bear alone, but you have something that you carry that's for you, and it's your, your task, your service alone. Paul says each one bears his own burden. So we are to examine ourselves. Where are we in Christ? Now, how does that position me to help my brother or sister in Christ? Verse 6, a kind of standalone verse, if you will. Verse 6 is basically help your teacher or share with your teacher. Now, I put that in there because I'm kind of your teacher, but I'm not asking for money. Um, I do teach as a vocation, 
And as a result, I do get paid for that. There are other times I may go speak and talk with people and I get paid for that. Now, the point there is that those who are helping you to grow in your faith, who have put forth the effort, who are teaching you to walk in Christ, uh, that who are studying the word, seeking the Lord in prayer, has been have been called to the ministry of helping guide um, when they teach you, when they share with you, when they guide you uh, in any kind of a formal way, Paul says that you should take care of them. He says this in verse six, the one who has taught the word is to share all good things with the one who teaches him. Now, sharing all good things doesn't necessarily mean pay. It certainly means sharing your life, sharing who you are. It means sharing other things. Uh, the point is that there is some kind of reciprocation. And of course, he'll talk about reaping and sowing in a moment. The point here is that you share. There's a certain gratitude that follows with being taught the word of God. He says you need to share with them. Why? He says they are the ones who teach you. Share the good things with the one who teaches you. And as a result, they're, they are there to guide you. In some way, then, as they teach you, they are helping you bear your burdens. And then as a result, you can learn to bear your own burden. And what then Paul can say is you share all good things. Um, maybe I can jokingly say I've received food for my services, um, you know, gifts, um, certainly, you know, cash helps. But the, the point there is Paul is recognizing how valuable it is that there is not only the carrying out of burdens and helping there, but there's also when someone teaches. Teaching is not... Um, an add-on to ministry. It is very much ministry. And uh, while it does involve talking and writing and things like that, uh, it still involves a lot of effort. And so Paul says, do good things to all who teach you. Give them all good things. Be mindful of what God has provided you in persons to help you walk in your faith. And that's really what that's all about. And of course, that doesn't mean always pay. I just let you know that it's the idea there to give good things. There may be different ways. I enjoy gifts too. So um, I've, uh, where I work, when I help with graduation or do something else, the office that helps, you know, will send a candy bar or something. It doesn't seem like a lot, but I'm like, I can get really giddy about that. So I could work for a candy bar. Now I can't do my whole life living off candy bars. Okay. So I, I need to have money to do what I need to do with bills and other things. And uh, it's important to have food on the table, but uh, in a nice, polite way, it's kind of neat to see while it may seem insignificant to some a small word of gratitude, a small card or something like that means a lot to me. And uh, just the need to acknowledge those who are involved in your life to teach you the word of God. Well, then he goes on and speaks in a little bit of a negative way in verses six or seven and eight when he talks about, about this warning. Uh, he's used the word about deceiving yourself. He says that in uh, verse three, he says that for anyone who looks uh, or thinks that he is something when he is nothing, then he deceives himself. We didn't talk a lot about that, but the issue then comes up here about deceiving yourself as well uh, and, and not to be deceived. So we need to be careful to have a healthy understanding of who we are, not to be thinking more highly of ourselves than we ought. Paul talks about that humility in Philippians. Here, he's talking about the fact that we may be, de we may be deceiving ourselves and we need to be careful not to deceive ourselves when it comes to the character of God. Notice what Paul says in verses 7 and 8. Do not, be deceived, de do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a person sows, this he will reap. Um, this is not the same as karma. Uh, we need to be careful as Christians using that term karma. You know, the, the idea of what comes around goes around. Um, the, this is a different kind of worldview we're talking about when we talk about the Eastern religions and they talk about karma that there is a, a direct response to what you do, good or evil. Um, that's not what's going on here. What Paul is saying when he talks about reaping what you're sowing is there is a natural, not only consequence, but reward for the things that you do. God is not going to be mocked. He's not going to be deceived himself. He's not going to allow anyone to uh, pull one over on him, so to speak there's a certain pattern in life. And it does carry over a little bit of the idea of retribution theology from the Old Testament, but in a little bit different way. In the Old Testament, if you were obedient to the blessings or to the, to the if you were obedient to the commands of God, you would receive the blessings. If you were disobedient to the commands of God, you would receive punishment and cursing. That plays out as the Israelites in the north and the Jews in the south go into exile under their respective regimes with the Assyrians against the people of Israel and the Babylonians against the people of Judah. Um, and we see that time and again. 
throughout the Old Testament that their actions, good or bad, led to reward or punishment. Uh, here, Paul is moving beyond that and talking about reaping what we're sowing. He'll talk in a positive way, and we can use that in a positive way as well. But the point is that there are going to be natural consequences. It's not something that God is seeking out to punish you for doing those things. Those are evident. We're also living in Christ, so that is a little bit different um, kind of atmosphere, a different kind of, well, it's a different covenant altogether. The point that Paul is making here is that you need to recognize as you go through this list and other things throughout the letter he talks about, there are going to be those things that come back in some way uh, as a result of the things that you do. Again, not in the sense of karma, as if there is some unknown manifestation that will just give you back what you've done, whether good or bad. Uh, there's a totally different worldview behind the term karma. Um, I don't even like the term what comes around goes around because uh, it's, it's it's pretty spiteful at times. Uh, we joke about it when something happens, and you've seen the videos entitled Instant Karma. And the point is someone's done something bad, and they immediately receive some kind of consequence for it. Paul is dealing with this in, this, in a way that indicates that you will have this as a natural response. You, what you sow, you will reap. The good that you sow, there will be good that you reap. The bad that you sow, the bad that you will reap. Let's read it again. A person sows whatever they, or they will reap whatever they sow. Okay? That's just a plan. That's just a given. That's just an obvious thing. Then he says this, and this is where he ties it into what he's been talking about throughout the letter, and particularly in chapter 5. Flesh versus spirit. What were the actions of the flesh? We looked at that in the last lesson in chapter 5. We looked at the fruit of the Spirit. He talks about walking by the Spirit. So he ties it all together. Again, while this may be a loose list of injunctions and exhortations, they're tied together with one another by certain keywords. They're also tied to the rest of the letter. Paul talks about what it means to live by the flesh and what it means to live by the Spirit. He says those who live or sow to his own flesh will reap destruction from the flesh. Notice that it's from within, that which is the source of, of your action becomes the source of your destruction. He says this doesn't even have to be God bringing punishment on you. This is something that's self-determined. You seek the flesh, the flesh will destroy itself. But the one who sows to the Spirit will reap life from the Spirit. So he says in chapter 5 near the end, to when you're walking in the Spirit, also follow the Spirit. Here he says, as you sow to the Spirit, then you will reap eternal life. So notice here the distinction, destruction versus life. Now, that sounds similar to what is said in the Old Testament about punishment and, uh, and cursing or disobedience and blessing for obedience. But we're in a different realm now. We're in a different covenant. And so some of these are just natural consequences, but certainly the idea of life by the Spirit comes about as a result of sowing to the Spirit. And so we need to be mindful of that. We are going to reap what we sow. So what we want to do is reap, um, or we want to sow into developing the fruit of the Spirit. And we want to sow into helping carry one another's burdens. We want to sow into helping others as they grow in Christ. And of course, we can extend that metaphor in a number of different ways. We want to be careful not to overextend it. But the point Paul is making is that there is, there is, a, there is a consequence. There's a natural outgrowth. There are results of the things that we do. Be mindful of that. And then he goes on in the last two verses to talk about personal goodness or keeping up with doing personal goodness and then helping others. So let's go ahead and read verses 9 to 10, doing good. He says, let's not become discouraged. Um, some translations say weary. Let's not become weary in doing good, for in due time we will reap if we do not become weary. So there is the word weary there. Um, do not become discouraged in doing good. Notice there is the sowing of goodness because he talks about reaping goodness. He says, but we have to do it if we're not, if we don't, it will, it will happen if we don't become weary. Uh, I remember years ago when I was working on my doctoral work and I was working on my dissertation and it took a couple extra semesters. I got a, um, a letter from Dr. Karen Bullock, who was the director of the PhD program at the time. And uh, it was basically this verse. Uh, do not become weary in well-doing, for in due time you will reap a harvest. And I was able to communicate to her some years later as she also came to work at the institution where I was. And I told her about that note 
And uh, I thanked her for that note because I took it in the way she intended it. And that was, I'm working hard. She goes, I know you're working hard. Now don't grow weary. Keep going. Keep it up. You'll make it. Uh, and when I told her that, she says, that's exactly the way I intended it. I wasn't trying to put pressure on you. I wasn't trying to um, rebuke you. He, she said, I just wanted to encourage you. Uh, I kept in touch with my supervisor and everything was good there. But, you know, sometimes things take a while. It was a good thing that I was doing. I was preparing for the work that God called me to do, and it became burdensome at times. There was a lot involved in it. But without prompting, without knowing me personally, she was able to write me a note and quote me that verse, and I really appreciated that. And I would want to extend that verse to you as well. Let me read it again. Let's not become discouraged in doing good, for in due time we will reap if we do not become weary. Well, what would be the reaping of my work on a dissertation? Be this dissertation. What would be the work of you reaping and or sowing into the life of another individual? You'd be reaping the goodness, the, the, the love that comes back from them. There are so many metaphors, so many ways we can extend the metaphor, so many ways we can illustrate the metaphor of sowing and reaping. Uh, as you give into others' lives, you will help. Um, here, she's, you know, Paul is talking about um, doing this for our own self, carrying our own burden, sowing where we need to sow and receiving, and then we will reap. So what we want to do is think about the good. Don't become weary. Don't become discouraged. Um, Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 to 30, Jesus enjoins people to come to him uh, who are weary and heavy laden. What Paul can do there is echo that a little bit here. Don't grow weary in well-doing. Then he closes out the passage with verse 10. So then while we have opportunity, let's do good to all people and especially to those who are of the household of the faith. And there's some parallel here with what was said in verse um, uh, verse 6 about doing good things for the one who teaches you. Uh, here it's about doing all good things as well. Now, it's the idea of doing good to others. Let me read that verse again so that I can tie in a couple of other themes. So then, while we have opportunity, let's do good to all people, and especially those who are of the household of the faith. Um, Paul is indicating here doing good, tying in with the idea of what we had with helping with others' burdens, with helping overcome sin. Here it's the idea of doing good, the idea of helping other people, doing good for them. He says for all people, and of course, though, he says especially for those who are of the household of the faith, in other words, for believers. And that sounds similar to what Jesus says in Matthew 25 when he gives the parable of the sheep and the goats. He says that, the, that for the, in as much as you've done it unto the least of these, my brethren, my children or my brothers, you've done it unto me. The point there is that uh, we do it good. Do we do good for each other? We are to love one another, Paul says. Uh, we are to love one another. Jesus says to love one another. Uh, we also see this in 1 John. We are, taught, we are called to love one another. And that means doing good for one another to help meet those needs. Not simply say we're praying for you, but what is there something you can do to help meet that need? Paul is bringing everything together here. We're going to look at the last few, ver the few last few verses here next lesson, but just want to kind of pull it all together for you again. This idea of carrying on, carrying others' burdens, carrying your own load, helping others in doing good for them. All of these things, Paul says, is like sowing into the Spirit so that you will reap life from the Spirit. Now, let me just qualify something here. You are doing good is not for the reward. Your motive should be doing it because it's the right thing to do, and it's because it's the outgrowth of the Spirit, the overflow of the Spirit in our lives, Jesus being formed in us. Clearly, Paul can still talk about reaping a harvest, that there is something that we receive in response to the good that we do for others. So I wanted to continue to encourage you in that regard. Let's, uh, let's have a word of prayer, and then we will discuss what next week's lesson is. Father, we thank you for this lesson. We thank you for Paul and his, his bluntness at times. We also thank you for his words of encouragement. Thank you that he can walk with us and, and teach us how to walk in Christ. I pray, Father, that we will take heed of his words to um, carry each other's burdens, to recognize what is our own responsibility and not put that on others. Help us to do good to those who teach us. Help us to do good to all people and those of the faith. Lord, we just pray you help us to know where to sow Help us to know where we are to give in to other people's lives and to other ministries. Help us then to do that knowing that there is a reward. And we don't do it for the reward, but we know that there is a harvest that we reap. We just want to live day by day. And I pray that 
ultimately what we reap in our work for you is the fruit of the Spirit, which will enable us to do even more for you. Fill in us um, all that we need, Father. Guide us by your Spirit. Help us to follow your Spirit. Make us more in the image of your Son. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, our last lesson is going to be coming up, and it is entitled, interestingly enough, it is entitled, Do Good. There's more to it than that. There's some final words here, words of blessing, uh, words of recognition uh, about Paul himself. But uh, we're going to be looking at Galatians chapter 6, verses 11 to 18 at that point. And uh, just bring our letter, our study of the letters of the Galatians to conclusion. I'll have more to say about concluding that lesson and at the end of that lesson and what it means for our study of the letter in, in, in its entirety. And until then, then the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his face to you and give you peace.